global sell-off intensifying this morning, led largely by tech. Want to uh, bring in Dan Ives, Managing Director at Webbush Securities. We're looking at the NASDAQ now off about 856 points. Of course, Apple, NVIDIA, uh, some of the big laggards. Dan, what do you make of the sell-off? Um, it's a falling knife at the moment. Do you want to catch the knife? Yeah, I mean, look, for us, uh, we're navigating investors to this white knuckle moment in terms of looking at the tech names and the winners, what I believe is going to be this AI revolution. Look, there's no doubt that investors over the weekend to, in today call and trying to say, is this the end? Is this the end of the tech bull market? I don't believe it is. I believe this is just a massive fear panic that will create the opportunities for NVIDIA to own Apple. Microsoft, Amazon, Alphabet. And that's always been our playbook the last 24 years covering tech. So when clients call you this morning, are you telling them to buy on this? Uh, we'll describe it as weakness, but boy, is it, it feels like it's more than weakness. Uh, yeah, I mean, we've been basically, uh, I'll, I'll say almost table pounding in terms of put the levels, put the names that you want to own that, that I believe are really going to view this as more of an opportunity rather than as you, you know, sort of catching a falling knife because of where the growth is. You look at earnings, you look at the numbers. I mean, I'm here actually in Tokyo, you know, and across Asia. The demand is here for AI. That is not leaving despite what we're seeing with this Nikkei sell-off here in the global route. That's that's what we're telling investors across the world today. Dan, I want to put Apple up on the screen for a second because one of the pressure points in addition to what's happened overnight, and then obviously the jobs number on Friday, was the disclosure that took place over the weekend, Saturday, that Warren Buffett has now officially halved to stake in Apple. He's still the largest shareholder in the company. Um, he's been trying to, it looks like, raise cash. He's obviously sold out of other stocks too, which I think is also weighing on the psyche of the market this morning. But you look, this stock now off 7%. What do you think is behind that, that, that sale? Hey, look, Buffett was selling a little on 1Q, right? Now, granted, the 50% sale, I mean, that was, uh, was eye-popping relative, and, and I think caught everyone's attention. It's going to add to pressure here. It's still his number one holding. He is a huge supporter of Cupertino, number one holding, you know, almost double uh, of B of A. Andrew, our view is, if you look at this last quarter for Apple, you look at the guidance, you look at what I view as 270 million iPhones in a window of an upgrade opportunity an AI-driven upgrade cycle ahead of us. That's reasons to own Apple, not sell it. Now look, when Buffett, when Buffett talks, everyone listens, no doubt, for good reason. But this is not the time to sell Apple, despite you know, some of the nervousness here. I think this is an opportunity, especially going in to what I view as really a historic upgrade cycle for Apple. We were talking to Tom Lee earlier in a sort of macro way about just how things are headed and, and what may happen over the next uh, month or two. His sense was you're never gonna, I don't know, never. It might be hard to get real stability uh, until October uh, so that even if you think uh, the market rips in the next couple of days after, after, after you know, falling, that it's very hard in the month of August and historically September before you actually know whether you have your sea legs or not come October. Yeah, look, I mean, I think Tom obviously has, has great words of wisdom. It is going to be a buckle the seatbelt moment, you know, over the coming months, especially even also going into the election. But if you look at the fundamentals in tech and a soft landing and a Fed cutting environment, I mean, that's the time to own tech. And I get it. The bears, I mean, the bears have won over the last week or two, right, after being in hibernation mode the last 18 months. And I get it. But if you look at quality tech, large cap tech into an AI, what I view as a once in a 40 year cycle, those are names you own here. And, and I think, you know, that's why we're out here hand-holding through this white knuckle period, not the time to head for the elevators. Dan, this is, uh, I mean, we, the, the earnings that we saw, <clears throat> sometimes people nitpick, but in general, pretty good for, for the MAG-7 across the board. So what we're seeing now is probably just some air coming out of the, you know, the enthusiasm, maybe some multiple... Uh, contracts a little. What happens if it's a negative feedback loop and, and actually things start softening up and you actually do get, you know, not just the, the multiple side of things, but the earnings side of things? Is it, isn't that, I mean, we're down 10% already in the NASDAQ. What, what, where could that bottom? Yeah, like the self-fulfilling prophecy. I, look, I think the worries there, 
right now unfounded, right? In terms of not just what we saw from earnings, but in terms of what I see, you know, here in Asia, in terms of our checks demand going into the rest of the year and into 2025. Look, that will be sort of a ghost that I think the street will be battling in terms of what could come around the corner. But but if you look at the fundamentals here, I mean, they are strong for tech. Balance sheets are strong. And again, it goes into a once in a 40 year type of cycle in terms of spending for AI. You know, look, there's going to be losers in this. Look at Intel. I mean, if that was obviously a disaster and some others, but in terms of quality tech, big cap tech, in terms of software semis, those are names you own here and, and you don't sell them despite obviously a lot of nerves that, that are going to be going on across the globe today. I got to, to interrupt with a really funny story that happened recently. McDonald's in China. If you order a McFlurry, they ask you if you want a NVIDIA keychain with it, and it only sells for $20. But the problem is, they only made that available to less than 10,000 customers. So their NVIDIA keychain is already sold out, and it's right now in the retail market and sells for hundreds of dollars. And Elon commented on this, and he said that he had no idea that this was happening, and added, in that case, I will definitely have some just for you to know the first link in description. Click on it if you want to buy this NVIDIA keychain. I don't know if this is a collaboration, but NVIDIA in China has posted about this, and also McDonald's in China posted about it. But anyways, in the next couple of years, this product might even sell for thousands of dollars. We don't get that many chances to buy rare collectibles like this. Anyways, Find the link at the description and hurry, because we have just 100 pieces left. Why are you so optimistic about this? What is What do you think is pointing us in the direction of this generative AI actually becoming that much more useful and controllable? Well, uh, the big breakthrough of ChatGPT uh, was reinforcement learning human feedback, which was uh, the way of using humans to produce the right answers, or the best answers, to align the AI on our core values or aligned our AI on the skills that we would like it to perform. That's probably the, just the extraordinary breakthrough that made it possible for them to open ChatGPT for everyone to, everyone to use. Other breakthroughs have, have uh, arrived since then. Guard railing, which, uh, which causes the AI to focus its energy or focus its response in a particular domain so that uh, it doesn't wander off and pontificate about all kinds of stuff that you ask it about. It would only focus on the things that it's been trained to do, aligned to perform, and um, uh, that it, it has deep knowledge in. The third, the third breakthrough is called uh, retrieval augmented generation, which basically is vectorized or data that has been uh, embedded so that we understand the meaning of that data. Mm -hmm. And so it's a more authoritative data set. It a, goes beyond right. just the trained data set, and that's it actually right. pulls from other sources. That's right. It's so not just pre-trained data be, source. Right. It's and something, exp, you know, for example, uh, it might be uh, all of the articles that you've ever written, all of the papers that you've ever written. And so now it becomes uh, something, a, an AI that's authoritative on your, uh, and it could be essentially a, uh, a chatbot of you. Uh, so everything that I've ever written or ever said could be vectorized and then create it into a semantic database. And then before an AI responds, it would, uh, figure, it would look, at, look at your prompt and it would, uh, it would uh, search uh, the appropriate content from that vector database and then augment it um, uh, in its gener generative process. Where do you draw the line between this is augmenting and helping people? Where do you see the line being drawn? And this is replacing certain things that humans do? Well, that's what tools do. Uh, we invent tools here. This, you know, this conference is about inventing technology that ultimately ends up being a tool. And that tool uh, either accelerates our work, um, uh, collaborates with us so that we could do uh, better work or even bigger work, uh, do work that's uh, impossible before. And so I, I think what you're going to, what you're, you'll likely see is that generative AI uh, is now going to be more controllable than before. We've been able to do that with using uh, rags, retrieval augmented generation to control uh, text generation better, reducing hallucination. Now we're using Omniverse with generative AI to control generative uh, images better. 
and uh, reduce hallucination. Both of those tools uh, help us be more productive and do things that we otherwise can't do. And so I think, I think um, for all of the artists in the world, uh, what I would say is, is uh, uh, jump on this tool, give it a try, um, imagine the stories that you're going to be able to tell uh, with these tools. And, um, uh, and uh, with respect to jobs, uh, I would say that it is very likely all of our jobs are going to be changed. In what way? Well, my job is going to change. Um, the way in the future, uh, I'm going to be prompting a whole bunch of AIs. Uh, everybody will have an AI that is an assistant. And so every single company, every single company, every single job within the company will have AIs that are assistants to them. Uh, our software programmers, as you, so you know, now have AIs that help them program. Uh, all, all of our software engineers have AIs that help them debug software. Uh, we have AIs that help our chip designers design chips. Uh, without, without AI, a hopper wouldn't have been possible. Without AI, Blackwell wouldn't be possible. You know, today, we're, this week, we're sampling, uh, we're sending out engineering samples of Blackwell uh, all over the world. None, none of the work that we do would be possible anymore without, without generative AI. And uh, th that's increasingly the case with uh, 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 our IT department helping our employees be more productive. Uh, it's increasingly the case with our supply chain team optimizing supply uh, to be as efficient as possible, um, or our data center team you know, using AI to manage the data center to save as much energy as possible. You mentioned Omniverse before. Yep. Uh, that's not new. But the idea that more generative AI would be within the Omniverse, yep. helping people create these simulations or yep. digital twins. Yeah, that's what we're announcing this week, by the way. So Omniverse talk about now, that. Omniverse now uh, understands uh, uh, text to USD. Um, it could uh, understand text to, uh, and has a semantic database so that it could do search of all the 3D objects. Um, and, uh, and that's how that, that young lady was able to, to say, fill, fill uh, the scene with a whole bunch of trees, uh, describing how she would like the trees to be organized and somehow it populates it with all these 3D trees. Then when, I, when that's done, that 3D scene then goes into a generative AI uh, uh, model, which turns it into a photorealistic model. And if you want the, the Ford truck to not be augmented, but to use the, the, the actual brand, um, brand ground truth, uh, then it would, it would honor that and keep that, uh, keep that in, the origin, in the final scene. And so, so I think if you, if you, if you do that, uh, so one of the things that, that we talked about is how every single, every single group in the company uh, will, have, will have AI assistance. And, and um, uh, there's a lot of questions uh, lately about, about um, uh, whether all this infrastructure that we're building is leading to productive work in companies. Uh, I just gave you an example of how generative AI is impossible without, without uh, uh, NVIDIA, NVIDIA's uh, designs being impossible without generative AI. So we use it to transform the way we work. But we also use it uh, in many examples that I've just shown you in creating new products and new technology that either makes possible uh, ray tracing in real time uh, or Omniverse that we can now uh, imagine and help us uh, create much larger scenes. What's hotter than NVIDIA stock this year? It's something that would be worth hundreds, if not thousands of dollars in the near future. The rare limited edition NVIDIA keychain collectible. Our initial stock vanished in seconds. Get yours now from the link below.